Welcome to the Why God Why podcast. My name is Peter Engler. We are brought to you by Browncroft Community Church. Uh, We exist to ask the questions that you probably don't feel comfortable asking in church. We are starting a brand new series with company Leader. Uh, They spell that L-E-A-D-R. And it's about work. And we know that a lot of the stress and anxiety and pain that we have has to do with our jobs, but we also know too that post COVID, there's a lot of questions that we're asking. So there's some very apparent, but also some timeless questions. So, Aaron, you know our guest. And the first question we're with Holly Tate. We're asking the question why does my company insist on me working nine to five? Get us started. What do you think, man? Yeah, well, thanks so much. Uh, this is a appreciate leader being part of this series and uh what a what a great series of topics and timely topics um certainly things that i know a lot of people are asking a lot of questions about and i am really excited that uh, that holly tate is our first guest here holly's a a good friend from many years and uh, so appreciate the work that she's been doing um in a number of places uh over the years um and uh yeah, I just, just wanted to welcome Holly here with us. I re, Kristen, my wife Kristen and I have been friends with Holly for a long time. I, do, I can tell you that she is very good at making uh, lattes, too, because we go way back to Ebenezer's Coffee House, the <laughs> National Community Church. Um, and um, yeah, but uh, now you're down at Leader. You're based in Houston, um, a long way from when I knew you were based at the well, you were in D.C. for a while, but you were in the Big Apple in New York City. But uh, now you're all the way in Houston. Uh, Holly, could you just kind of give us a quick overview of what Leader is and maybe and how you got there? What's some of your story before we get into this fun question? Yes. Well, thanks for having me, Peter and Aaron. This is so fun because, yes, Aaron has known me for many years, and I have the honor of knowing Aaron when he was um very much in pursuit of his wife, Kristen. But I got to see <laughs> the, uh, you know, lingering at the coffee shop I after work. I was the coffee house, house yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was so good. So it's just an honor to be here. And um, yeah, this is a fun conversation, not only this topic, because I've kind of been on my own journey of transition over the last nine months or so. Um, but yeah, so I, uh, my a little bit of my story, I was born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, and then I went to college at a school called the King's College in New York City. And then that's where I met Aaron because I interned one summer at the coffee shop Ebenezer's that's with National Community Church there. And so she did was, by the way, so the, the best barista that we ever had. Um, I mean, I think oh. Kristen would agree with that too. So I, I know, know I probably Kristen... just offended all the other baristas, but I'm just going to go out and say Holly is like. The one, so. <laughs> I'll take it. Although I will say I could never do the coffee art that Kristen can do. She, <laughs> I think she does. And oh, yeah. I, I should have said with the exception of Kristen, of course. Yes. Go ahead. So. Yes. With the exception <laughs> of Kristen. He's number one. Yeah. yeah. I saved you on that one, Aaron. You're welcome for that. <laughs> you sure did. Man, I was um, almost in big trouble. <laughs> yes. But yeah, so then um, after my time in New York City, I moved to Dallas where I was selling radio. Uh, That was, you know, great job, 23, right? I'm like, what am I doing? I am selling radio. But that actually was a wonderful opportunity. And I would tell anybody who's listening that's thinking about career or jobs, at least um, any time in your career. But I love saying this to folks who are just graduating from college or maybe a couple years out is do sales for a little bit because it builds resilience and really helps you learn a lot really fast. So I did that for the first year out of college. And one of those cold calls that I made to try to sell radio advertising was to um, a company called Vanderblumen. And so that was uh, almost 10 years ago now that I made that cold call. And Vanderblumen was really creating a market. So they were um, the first church staffing firm. So executive search had been around in the corporate world for a really long time, but there was really a need for churches to have a um, best practices for hiring um, come to the church world. And so that's what William Vanderblumen started. So as part of the Vanderblumen team, um, really from the beginning, about a year and a half in, all the way up to um, last fall, where I'd been there for almost nine years. And it was an amazing journey. We got to help um, thousands of churches and values-based businesses and ministries all over the world, really help them hire the right people and, and lead their teams better. And so I personally joined a coaching group 
in 2020, which I think a lot of people were asking the question in 2020, like, okay, the whole world has turned upside down. So taking a look at, you know, who am I and what do I want to do? And I'm sure there's a lot of listeners who are asking those questions right now. And so I joined a coaching group to really unpack my, my personal values and mission statements and like, what did I want my career to look like? And so that led me um, to start my own marketing consulting company last fall. And as a part of that season, leader, which I know is very confusing. We are you know, trying to be hip and cool and uh, spell it differently, L-E-A-D-R, um, keeping everybody on their toes, but they became a client of mine. And I was already in love with the mission. That's why I took them on as a client because our mission is to develop 1 million leaders. And that's what gets me out of bed every day is people development, leadership development. Uh, that's why I'm really passionate about the topic that we're gonna dive into today is creating a workplace where people can thrive. And um, I was already in love with that, but in the three months where they were a client of mine, just fell in love with our product, our customers and our team. And so I joined the team full time in March of 2021. And I'm um, senior vice president of growth. So right now I'm really focused on um, building our marketing team and thinking about growth for customer success and our product and what's the vision of the future of our people development software that we're building. So yeah, um, I'm also an entrepreneur. I own a cocktail mixer company, co-own one of those. So I've got my hands in a lot of different things, which is why this topic is is really uh, <laughs> pertinent to me today. So that was a very long answer to your question, Aaron. How's oh, that? You've got a lot, there's a lot going on, that's for sure. Um, no, that's that's so that's so great um, and it's so exciting. Um, yeah, so you 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 started to hit on this. Um, by the way, I should say too, we we uh, enjoy using Leader here at Browncroft too. So we we appreciate the product you're you're working with also. Um, well, we are so grateful that you guys are on the leaderboard. So we are very <laughs> yes. very grateful. On the leaderboard, yes, I like that. You're on the leaderboard. Uh, Congratulations. <laughs> Um, so, well, I mean, so you through leader, um, and also through, uh, when you were with Vanderblom and just, I mean, just in general, you've worked with lots of organizations. I mean, a lot of Christian organizations, a lot of, uh, ministries. Um, and also I, I'm, a, I'm sure other just in general organizations as well, um, schools and yeah. others too. So like you, you got to see up close organizational cultures, change i mean almost overnight um can you tell us like you know this this question the question we we're focusing on today why does my company insist on me working from nine to five well i mean just let's step back from that for just a minute there i think part of this question is that there is a there's a work from home component that was there before covid came around mm -hmm. um can you just kind of walk us through what was it like before? Um, what was it like to have flexible hours before? And then how did you see things change with a lot of the organizations you work with almost overnight? Yes, so before COVID, I feel like this topic was pretty all or nothing. And it was very, people had very strong opinions about it, right? And still do, we'll get to that in a second. But <laughs> it was either you've gotta be all in person, like our whole team has to be together in person or our entire team has to be remote, right? And a lot of leaders took very strong stances on that opinion of one side of the spectrum or other. Like we're gonna be completely remote, build a whole remote company, everybody's remote or we're all going to be in person and you've got to move to this city or this town if you want to work for our organization well what we saw right was that all of that got turned upside down with covid where the folks that are on the remote side i think they felt like yeah we're right you know we've had it right all along and everybody wants to be remote and see how this works so well and then everybody on the in-person side of the spectrum really had to look in the mirror and go, oh crap, like, what do we do now, you know? Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But what I'm seeing now is people realizing that hybrid is the future. Because I think what happened was, there's a lot of people who worked from home for the first time that were working in those in-person environments that have decided that they want the opportunity to work remotely for the foreseeable future. Right. They want that option. But then there's a lot of people who also worked from home and hated it. 
they did not thrive working remotely. And so they desire to be more in person. And so what I think we're going to see is a future and where I really think teams and organizations are going to win in the future. Well, not even in the future now, like I heard a stat earlier today. I think 40% of people are actively looking for new jobs, 40%. So that means four out of 10 people on your team right now are probably actively submitting their resume, talking to their friends about looking for a new role. And a lot of it, I think, is because leaders are still having the debate over all remote or all in person and are not realizing that the now and the future for teams that are going to win is hybrid. It's giving the option for both and even and not even permanently. It might be that Holly wants the option to work from home some days and work in the office some days and to be able on the daily or weekly basis to be able to choose. So that's the big shift that I've seen is rather than it being polarized, well, I mean, it still is polarized, that really innovative organizations are landing on the fact that hybrid is the future and that's how we're gonna recruit and retain the best team members. You know, it, it, it's interesting as you bring that up, um, you know, we have a bunch of questions, but I have the I have all these conversations with people that just uh, to frame what you just said. So I have a friend, we're, we're gonna call him Robbie, that's not his name, but Robbie's an analyst and he's like really frustrated that his organization is asking him to come back because he's an analyst. He's saying, you know, I'm not this in-person, like you pay me to analyze data and spit back reports. Like, so I kind of hear his frustration of, I don't want to come back. And then I also have a friend, you know, who has, you know, a very key administrative assistant that kind of does some interacting with the clients, needs to be there because there's in-person meetings. And this person's like, I just want to work from home. and you know, he's like, uh, you can't buzz people in from home. Now there's technology to do that, but so, uh, you know, I guess kind of hearing from you too, how do you navigate kind of this discussion with roles? Because there's certain people in certain roles that it's like, I could do this. And then there's other, like, I can't fully pastor digitally. So I don't know, I'll just throw that out there to you. Yes, it's a great question. And I was just having a conversation with somebody about this yesterday. So I've been thinking about this a lot and I don't know that I have. Um, well, I don't I don't think it's black or white. Like, I don't think you can say all administrative assistants need to be in person or all administrative assistants need can be remote. Right. Um, I I think that the way organizations and leaders should think about this is one, what does success look like in this role? I'm still mm. amazed at how many organizations cannot answer that question after they've already posted the job or even after they've already hired the person. It's like before we even write the job description, we should be able to answer what does success look like in this role? So what are the outcomes that we desire this role to achieve? What are the goals that we need them to, to achieve? What are the responsibilities that they're going to oversee? So what does winning look like? What does success mm -hmm. look like in this role? Then the second question is, who is the right person for this role? Okay, so first, what does success look like in the role? Second, who's the right person for this role? And then the third question is, where does that person do their best work? Or how mm -hmm. does that person do their best work? Because if we start with the end in mind, which is success, then we've hired the right person, we wanna set that person up for success. And if that means that they they need to work remotely or that they need to be in person to do their best work or they want a hybrid, then that should be the answer to that question. So I think it's just a reprioritization of um, the questions that we're asking when we're building our team that helps us come to that answer because it's gonna be a different answer for every role and for every person that we hire. So um, that at least is the conclusion I've come to in the last couple of days as I've been thinking a lot about this conversation and even having conversations on our own team at Leader because we're a hybrid team. We've got about half of our team is located in Plano, Texas, um, and then half our team is, is remote. And so we're navigating these conversations. Like, what does it look like? Who do we require to be in the office? Who do we allow to be remote? And who's hybrid? And what does that look like for our team um, moving forward? And I think it's kind of a moving target right now, but I would encourage leaders to think about those three questions in that order. What is success in this role? Who's the best person for this role? And then how does that person do their best work? 
That's that's uh, that's really good, Holly. I um, and a lot of good stuff to chew on there. Um, how do you how do you find that that has affected um, either for good or for bad um, culture within organizations? So, like when I was when I was thinking about this, when I was getting ready for this conversation, I was just you know you brought up a, a four in ten number, which I thought was really interesting. By the way, when you said that, Peter looked at me. I don't really you know. People, <laughs> I don't know if he's yeah. telling me I should get my resume. I'm not really sure how to take that, but um, anyway, we're just gonna let that one I, let that one go for now. We'll have but, to rewind the video and like yeah. look at Peter's face and uh, see dissect <laughs> what, what that meant. Yeah. Is he trying to send me a message? I don't know, but uh, I guess you'll know if I'm hey, here in the hey, next hey, podcast. Hey, or hey, not. Hey. I I want to keep Aaron. I'm gonna say that officially. I I just four and ten. It was just a surprising number. So anyways, yeah, right? I'm, just, I'm just kidding with you, Peter. I know. Um, I know. But uh, I, I found actually, so I was looking, I found some Pew Research numbers and um, it was talking about how things have changed in the work environment in the, during the pandemic period. These numbers came out, they came out in December, but they were, if it was a study in October, um, it talked about how 40% of people who work from home, they feel like they have more flexibility now to choose their hours. Um, and then, but it also said that 57% of those people felt less connected to their coworkers. And, um, you know, what it, actually, and another thing I thought was interesting, particularly given, you know, I think a lot of the people who listen to this podcast too, is I, I wonder if there's an, an age um, a d difference in how different ages uh, approach this too, because it, it mentioned that um, quite a number of people who are under, under uh, the age of 50 even had less of a motivation to work. I mean, just because of because of the work from home environment. So let me just, I guess, whether we're talking about productivity, whether we're talking about um, inner office relationships, like how, how have you, and maybe there could be good things too, I'm not trying to say that there's just negative, but what, so what, what have you seen in the ministries that you've been working with? Yeah, for sure. I think to answer this question, we have to start with what is culture, right? Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think sometimes when people throw out this word culture, um, we, we say, you know, oh, we really want a healthy culture or we have a bad culture or we have a really great culture. And then we're like, wait, but what is culture? And so, um, you know, just to oversimplify culture, it's really the values and the beliefs of an organization or of a group of people. Right. And then when we talk about workplace culture, it's the values and the beliefs, uh, the shared values and beliefs of an organization. The culture of a country is the shared values and beliefs of that country, right? So that I think is where we need to start, the shared values and beliefs. Now, if we're clear on what our values and beliefs are as an organization, it should not matter whether we're in person or remote, our culture should be clear. It should be clear what those shared values and beliefs are. I think the problem is when we have in-person cultures and those that are um, staunch, like everybody has to be in person. I often think that they feel so strongly that way because they have yet to define the shared values and beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so it's easier. I mean, just to answer the question of the title of this podcast, why does my boss require me to work from nine to five? It's because it's easier. Like in-person work, it's easier. Wow. It doesn't mean yeah. it's best, but it's easier from a leadership perspective. Because you can see people, you can see when they're coming in and out, you can have those quick last minute conversations. And so for folks who um, are adamant about in person, I think it's because they haven't taken the time to really define those, those shared values and beliefs. And so their culture is caught with a C rather than taught with a T. Because in person, it's easier to catch things. It's easier for, and you know, in culture starts from the top down, right? And so it's easier in a culture where you're in person for that leader or the leadership team, for those shared values and beliefs that are unspoken, they're not defined to infuse into the organization because everybody's in person, so you can catch it. Whereas remote cultures are forced to define those shared values and beliefs because they're remote. And it's harder to catch things over Zoom or over Slack. In fact, it can be confusing and often conflicting if you don't define those shared values and beliefs. And so, again, I think it's super important, no matter whether you're in person, no matter whether you're remote or hybrid, you've got to do the work to, to define your shared values and beliefs because that's your culture. Because here's the deal, you have a culture, whether you've defined it or not. 
So it's better that you define it and really shape it so that your team can share it rather than it your culture defining you. And when that happens, it's usually in a negative way. So I saw the teams that had defined shared values and beliefs really thrive in a remote setting because it was already stated. And so it didn't matter, you know, if that shared value was, um, you know, a customer f- first mindset, if that was the value, then it didn't matter if we're in person or remotely, we're focused on our customers first. But those organizations who had not clearly defined them, um, they struggled because it's harder to catch things when when you're remotely. So Holly, my wife's a therapist, so a lot of times I invite people like yourself to get free therapy. So, um, so I, <laughs> well, I'm definitely not, full disclosure, not a therapist. <laughs> well, I, well, we'll say work therapist, but so Aaron and Aaron and I wrestle with this all the time. So I think people ask me, why do you have a podcast? you know, at the church and our mission is to invite people uh, into a life changing relationship with Jesus, mobilizing, making disciples. Did I get that right? Yeah, I close. got that right. So yeah. I'm pretty close that invite, that, make, mobilize, invite, make, mobilize. That's that's why we get the communications director here. And so I, I kind of because I sense this is that, you know, we do digital to kind of connect inviting people to life change. Even while we're doing this question is we feel like people during the week are asking this question. I have a ton of choices of how I could do this. I could fly you from Houston, um, you know, and you've got a huge retainer, which we would gladly pay, like, and you're, do, you know, you're doing this out of the kindness of your heart. And just kind of, cause I feel like there's this tension with digital and even Aaron and I struggle with this, like just the metrics of that. And I think that that kind of touches on, cause I'm sure that there's millennials and Gen Z's that are kind of like, hey, Slack, Facebook, that's real stuff. Like this Facebook group I'm using, but then there's other people that are asking this question, you know, we used to have 70 people show up for this event and that was it. So I, I think we're, I'd kind of look for you for therapy and expertise is, how do you have the right conversations about that to know what the win is, but also just to like, this is 20, 30 years down the road. We're making decisions now that are really, really important to this next generation. We want to, you know, be there for our stakeholders and for the core people, but we also have to say like, this world's changing. I just threw a lot out there. Walk us through it. (laughs) I love it. And here's the deal. I am learning this as well. Um, And, and, and I think, I mean, we all are right. It's um, everything's changing so fast. The reality is generation Z and millennials are now officially, if you add the two together are 46% of the workplace. I think that's a 2020 stat. 46% 46% of the workplace are millennials and G, but Gen Z, <laughs> I need to not talk as fast. I'm getting my words mixed up. But um, here's what's interesting. I just did a talk on Monday to a group of executive pastors on how to lead Generation Z because I'm a millennial. So I'll be 33 in a couple months. And I um, am now for the first time leading Generation Z in the workplace because Generation Z is technically under 20, 25. Some people would say 25. Some people would say 24. So let's just say 25 and under. Um, And they are even so different from millennials. I had this moment in a meeting with a Generation Z person that I was leading. And I had this moment where I thought, I am not the young one anymore. Like now I know why Generation X was all concerned about figuring out how do we lead millennials. And so um, I will say, if you're still having that question, uh, good luck. You you should have figured that out already. Now the puzzle to solve is Generation Z. Because And here's why I bring that up, um, Peter, is because I surveyed um, some of our team at Leader that's Generation Z to ask them, um, who's your ideal, like give me three adjectives about your ideal boss, three adjectives about your ideal workplace, and then um, talk to me about what would keep you in a role for three plus years, and anything else you wanna share you know, to um, for leaders who wanna lead Gen Z well. And what was really interesting, a couple of things that came out of that. One is the word flexibility came up a lot but also relational and connectedness came up a lot. And then one of them, which I was like, this is so insightful for a 20, I'm not sure how old he is, I don't know, 22, 23. He said, here's the deal. We are so connected through social media and through digital technology, 
but it's, it's wide connectedness. Mm. We desire deep connectedness. So go deep with us. We don't want to, it's not about more connections. It's about deep connections because we feel mm. isolated and lonely and unknown, even though we're more connected than, than ever before. And I thought that was really insightful. So to your point, Peter, I think it's about asking ourselves the question, when we're making decisions about like what meetings should be in person versus in you know over digital communication, which roles should be in person versus digital, et cetera. Um, I think the question is, is it how wide or deep do we need to go in this? And if it's something that um, you know where we really need to go really deep with with each other, that that's probably a time for us to say, you know, does this need to be in person? Especially, don't underestimate how much Generation Z wants to have face-to-face -face communication. Now, it doesn't mean that it has to be physically face-to-face. -face. It might mean rather than rather than sending a text or giving them a call, it might mean FaceTiming them, right? That's face-to-face. -face. They're used to communicating face-to-face -face even digitally. Um, but I think it's important that we not underestimate how much they desire that connectedness and a face-to-face -face connection um, when I've even been guilty of it, thinking like, oh, you know, they're digital natives. They're, they're even more savvy than I am as a millennial. But it sounds like they really, they desire both the flexibility, but also deep relational connectedness. So really interesting. I don't know that I have like clear cut answers for you, but that's what I'm learning as I'm studying them as well. I love that response because I don't think there's like an answer, but I think what I hear you saying is, um, I had a boss, Sam Huey, that used to say no dumb meetings. And, you know, even kind of the framework that I'm working on, and you can push back on this, if I'm going to talk 70% of the time in person, that probably should be something that's digital. But if I'm going to have people together, I want to have a dialogue and a conversation. So, you know, how this plays out for me, I'm a pastor of small groups. Like that 10 to 12, even that three to four, like I think events are really important. They're changing. I think we're gonna go back to conferences, but I also think that some of that's gonna change because I don't feel like, if I'm gonna ask someone to come in person, I want them to feel like they're investing and they're able to say something. And even that's why we do a podcast. Like, sure, we could have 30 people in person here, but I've got two kids under four years old. The the liability of me coming, but if I, you know, I think about the people that I spend time with, if I spend two to three hours with four people having a deep conversation, that kind of drives that depth of connection. I don't know, am I on the right page of kind of your research? I mean, push back on that. Yeah, no, totally. I think it's the difference between are we asking people to consume information or content or are we asking for them to contribute to the mm. information or the content? And so if, in, if, especially for Generation Z, if it's like, if I'm just consuming this, why in the world do I need to be in person? Like they're used to multitasking. They've got their, their TV up, their homework in front of them while they're listening to music at the same time. I mean, why in the world would they want to be in person? But if they're contributing, if they can be a part of something, if it's intentional, that was a word that came up over and over again was intentionality, then that changes the conversation. And I think they would appreciate face-to-face -face or in-person um, in that situation. Hey, Holly, so let me, let me sort of, I think sort of follow up on what you guys were just talking about, but I'm, so I'm curious. Is the is the in person versus work from home or hybrid now conversation? Is that the same as the nine to five conversation? Like, are there are those different? Good. Yeah, like because it, it seems to me like even in, in both situations you could have strong feelings about about both. What what have you found in the organizations you work with? Yeah, so I think they are a little different, Aaron. I'm glad you brought this up because I was thinking about um, that as well. So. The conception is, for those that are very adamant about in-person, the conception is if I can't see you, then you're not working. Uh, and that's where, for those of us that work remotely, it's so important to me that we are available between nine and five, that we are engaged between nine and five. So I don't think the question is the hours necessarily. I mean, I do think, I, I do believe we're gonna see a day where it's less about the hours that you work or the time that you work and more about your output. Um, I would encourage every leader to start thinking that way because the reality is, is you can have somebody, the butts and seats mentality where everybody's in the office with 
you know, their butt in their seat from nine to five. That doesn't mean that they're effective though. So just, just being there for a certain number of hours does not equal effectiveness. So that, that means as leaders, it's up to us to define effectiveness. And that's why I think people want people in person because it's easier because they, they see someone and they think that's effectiveness. It's not, we've got to define what success looks like in that role that, and then that's effectiveness. That should be the benchmark. It shouldn't be about how many hours they're working or where they're working, although we're still very much in that. So Aaron, I think it's important that if we desire more freedom. So if there's somebody listening today that's like, man, I know I could do my job in half the time if I had more flexibility or if I didn't have to work from nine to five or if I could choose more flexible hours, I think it is critical that first of all, you are crushing it in your role. Like you've got to be crushing it. There's no way you can go to your manager or your boss and say, hey, I want more flexibility but you're not performing well in your role. It's just not gonna work because you haven't built trust. It's all about trust. Um, uh, Matt Tresseter, our CEO uh, leader says that organizations move at the speed of trust. And so it's up to you as that contributor, if you desire more flexibility, you've got to build trust. You've got to crush it. Um, and then that allows you the opportunity to open the conversation to say, hey, I was thinking about this, I'd really love some more flexibility. What if we just dipped our toes in that and, and maybe you propose just a, a short, you know, a little tweak. Maybe it's, hey, I know you want me to work from nine to five. I think I'd be a lot more effective if I could start earlier in the morning and, and get off at three. What if I did six to three? Or what if I did, you know, four 10 hour days and then I had Friday off, right? So, um, those are those are some options to dip your toe in the water, but you've got to be successful in your role before you can broach that conversation. So I think they're a little bit separate, Aaron. Related, but separate. Well, and I, I love how Aaron asked that because it, it gets me thinking, uh, I haven't read this book, so if someone comes back and says this book was terrible, I, I, I've only heard a podcast about it, but Daniel Pink wrote the book When, um, where he talks about there's morning people, afternoon people, and night people, and it, even if you don't necessarily have the trust built up, obviously that's an assumption, but it seems like even from what you're saying is, hey, this next week you've given me these tasks to do. I'm a night owl. Can I work, like, if I get this done, you know, can I work from 10 to midnight? Because that's kind of when I, like, have them, like, can we at least try it? You know, and it's almost like putting yourself on the hook for that. That sounds like a very easy conversation to at least, br your boss might still say no, but at least you're getting them thinking. I think that's what I hear you saying. Yep, it's all about proactive communication and proactive communication builds trust. So it's, and then you, you better have some emails or some communication going to your boss if you're up at those night owl hours, like you said you were, because they're going to be thinking, I wonder if they're really working at that night owl shift, right? So it's all about that proactive communication to help build trust. Um, but that's exactly right, Peter, to be able to bring that proposal with, because um, you're leading with what success looks like. Hey, here's what, here's what we've agreed upon of what success looks like, and here's how I'd like to achieve that success these couple morning hours, working late at night, whatever it might be, but it's going to get done. I'd love the opportunity to show you that I can that I can do this and knock it out of the park. Well, so one of the reasons I love Leader, and again, uh, Leader isn't paying us anything to say this, so I just want to throw it out there. Um, so Leader actually, um, you know, in the tool, it creates in meetings like a task list that you can kind of check off. I, I think the struggle is, and going back to what you said maybe 20 minutes ago, is when there isn't clarity on what to do and you have a boss that might have forgotten what they asked you to do and you got it done. And, you know, so how do I have that conversation? Um, and maybe we need to buy a leader. How do I have that conversation with my boss of, hey, you know, what are the things you need me to get done? Like, because I, I think sometimes bosses, especially mid-level managers, are really, they're exacerbated, they're scared, they've got, they're anxious. So how would you coach someone to even get to that trust, even if they feel like they're effective and just, I don't know, I, I, I think you probably walk through that all the time. Yeah. So two things come to mind, Peter. One is, 
if you work for somebody that you're sensing is what you just described of, um, you know, overwhelmed or anxious, if you want to keep that job, the best way that you can build trust and add value to that manager that's overwhelmed is to find those opportunities where you can add value. To, to anticipate what are those pain points. Man, my boss seemed, you know, she was talking about how this project, she feels stuck and she's really not sure about the next step. Maybe I can come to her with some ideas uh, and, and build a proposal for her to help alleviate that pain that she's experiencing in her role. That is a way to build trust and add value if you are someone who's really trying to grow in your career. So that would be the first thing is don't wait to be told um, make your seat at the table. And you do that by anticipating what your leadership that you work for needs, because they might not even be at a place where they can communicate it. And then secondly, to turn it on the other side, um, us as the leader, we've got to be able to communicate what success looks like. And if we are not setting those clear goals, we're doing a disservice to our team. And so if you are working for someone who is not overwhelmed, but is just a really is just, I was going to say, it's just a terrible leader, or maybe I should say it needs help in their leadership. Um, in those one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, to say, you know, hey, I would love to work on some clear goals. So I'd love to hear what does success look like for you in your role? You know, 90 days from now, what would just make you want to do cartwheels because you're so happy you brought me on the team? And then just listen and see what they say and then craft some goals or some projects around their answer to that question. So again, for that person that's listening that works for that manager that might not have set clear goals for them to say, hey, what does success look like for you in my role in 90 days? What would just make you so excited and grateful that you brought me on the team? And, and then craft some projects and some goals around that and then follow through. Follow through. That is the biggest differentiator, I think, between folks that um, add the most value to the team and, and those, you know, kind of like the difference between good and great, I guess, is what I'm trying to say is is those that really follow through because um, it's it's hard to find people that really follow through on their commitments these days. So make sure you do that. So, uh, Holly, you mentioned the importance of trust, um, and I, I, th I think that's a powerful uh concept, a powerful thing to say. I think it's, I mean, I think I love that saying of, you know, organizations move at the speed of trust. Um, what about, so there's, there is the trust level between the em employee and their boss. Um, the person who wants the more flexibility or maybe doesn't want the more flexibility. I don't know. Um, I guess it depends on the yeah. person, but, but like there's that trust relationship. What about trust horizontally? Like if you can't, if in a hybrid situation you have some people who you can't see all the time versus those you can like what what are way what have you seen in organizations and what are ways to um mitigate potential distrust that could arise from that holly he, yeah. uh, she's uh aaron's asking because i'm sitting right next to him so just uh just yeah. you know <laughs> go ahead just tell me what to do <laughs> that's awesome a little bit of group therapy it's awesome yeah, so first I would say for you as the an, ind an individual contributor, um, so I'll speak to this first and then I'll speak to you as a leader. So as an individual contributor, one of the best ways you can do this, regardless of whether it's in person or through you know Slack or Teams or text message, whatever your means of communication might be, is to, to make it a point to ask the question, how are you doing and how can I best support you this week? Mm. And make a point to do that to team members that you don't have regular communication with on a weekly basis. And maybe you do that even if it's just once a month, just starting there. So I'll try to do that because I'm remote. Um, there's a lot of team members that are on different teams that I never see or I'm never in meetings with. And so I try to make a point to um, send them a quick note and just say, you know, hey, Aaron, how's your week going? How can I support you this week? And that just shows that um, you're not in it for your own personal goals or silo, but you're really looking out for your team members and the organization's goals as a whole. And then as a leader, I would say, you know, I would recommend that every leader has a one-on-one -on -one with each direct report that reports obviously directly to them on a weekly basis, you know, 30 minute one-on-one uh, -on, -one on a weekly basis. But then maybe you're doing either cross uh, um, organizational check-ins 
or a tier down. So maybe they don't re directly report to you, but they report to somebody that reports to you about once a month or at least once a quarter, I would say, if you're on the leadership team. This goes a long, long way to showing that you really care about your team and that you're out to develop them and more than just the people that, that report directly to you. Um, so that would be my piece of advice as the individual contributor and then leading the team. Wow, this uh, this episode went by like so fast, and uh, I know, we're, right? <laughs> we're we're about to email. Uh, you mentioned Matt Tressider; he's coming right up. Um, so, what I want to do is number one, um, Holly, we're gonna have you back. Uh, that's that's final and done. Oh, we'll, we got some last. <laughs> So, um, you know, we close every episode with a question, you know, what does Jesus have to say about this topic? And um, so Aaron and I answer, but then, you know, we ask our guests to kind of clean up anything that we might have messed up. So what does Jesus have to say about my boss or my organization insisting on working nine to five? Should I get started? Sure. Go for it. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to be real pastoral right now. I'm just going to say if Jesus is our boss, um, ultimately, you know, as Christians, there's something freeing about him being the one that we honor and glorify. And, you know, you might say, well, I'm de-churched, I'm unchurched, but I think that that just kind of changes the game because we are, we are led imperfectly and we follow imperfectly. So I think by changing it and kind of seeing it as faith, I'm in this job, you know, God has me here and maybe I'm one of the 40% that's looking for another job. How can I make the most of this situation? I think that this question, as you struggle with it and where we're landing, which is, this is really a question about trust. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of things I can't control. And in some ways I can't control trust but I can control the checklist. I can control the questions with my boss and I can make the most of the opportunity that Jesus gave to me with that. So that's kind of where I'd land. I don't know, Aaron, what about you? No, I think that's really good, Peter. I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, Jesus wants us to do well in whatever situation we are, we are in, um, whichever situation, uh, what jobs that he allows us to come into. Um, and, yeah, I, I think that I really, I really think that that word trust is key to this whole conversation. And, um, and you know, uh, whether it's working a regular, you know, a, a traditional nine to five schedule, whether it's work from home, whether it's work in an office, whether it's working the night owl shift, I mean, I think all of it come for an effective organization um, will come down to um, trust being a key element of the the culture and and um i think being being faithful as a an employee or a um boss a leader within the organization either way um or both because a lot of times you're both um building that trust is important not just for the organization it's also important for uh your witness for christ um in whatever the situation is so that's what i think holly clean it up for us no, drop the mic. I just learned a ton from both of you on that. And I love that you asked this question because it made me think. It was, uh, it was like, yeah, what does Jesus say about um, if our boss wants us to work from a nine to five? And so um, I was thinking about Matthew 10. So this is where Jesus is talking to the disciples and he's kind of getting ready. He's getting them ready for after he's crucified, to, like go back and have to talk with the religious leaders and the synagogues and into this culture where he's leaving them. Right. And he says, look, I'm sending you out just like sheep among wolves. So be as wise as snakes and as gentle as doves. Mm. And I feel like as Christians, we tend to be on one side or the other. We have a lot of Christians who are um, who are gentle as doves and honestly get themselves in some really toxic situations, especially in the workplace, because they feel like they just have to um, bow down to whatever their boss says and they can get them into some really unhealthy situations. And then I feel like we've got a lot of Christians on the other side of the spectrum who um, really attach to the wisest snakes part and maybe are a little bit too... Um, sneaky or sly or uh so anyway for me that verse was like wow how can we hold the tension of being wise as snakes and gentle as doves 
both together. Um, and I think that's what Jesus would love to see in us is that we have the confidence of a, a commitment to excellence because our, we want our work to honor him and glorify him. But also we want to stand up for what is right and really, um, being able to, uh, to lead well. And sometimes that means having really hard and uncomfortable conversations, mm -hmm. but that's just as important as being, and, and we can do that, uh, as if we're gentle as doves. So that's, that's what came to mind, um, for me in this question. Wow. That's a great place to close. Great tension. Uh, you know, I would encourage all of you to, you know, to share this episode. You've probably got friends. If you have a great relationship with your boss, I'd share it. If you don't, I, I wouldn't. Um, but <laughs> I, you know, and if, if you're a boss, I, I would also encourage you to share this episode with the people that you work with to just have a conversation and build some trust. So you can follow Holly. I, I think it's at Holly Tate. We're going to we're going to, you know, we're going to tag you. So you're going to be all set. And, yeah. uh, and leader L E A D R. Uh, and yeah, we, uh, we're so glad to have you. Remember for the why God, why podcast, go to why God, why podcast.com subscribe to our email. That's the best way to stay connected. And, um, you know, I had so much fun just being a fly on the wall while you and Aaron talked, you know, <laughs> Oh, that was a great conversation. No, this was a blast. I'm so grateful for both of you and for Browncroft and all the amazing um, work and community that you're building there in Rochester. So grateful for you guys and, and that you're a leader customer. Just so many awesome connections. And thanks for inviting me into this conversation. Awesome. Thank you so much, folks. We hope you have a great day.